let's begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all here today. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to 2023, a year whose name sounds like science fiction and definitely the future. Uh, I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'm really glad to welcome you to an hour of conversation. Welcome to the science fictional year of 2023. And I wanted to kick off the forum this year by asking all of us to think about what topics, what ideas, what forces, what trends, what issues, what challenges are likely to have the biggest impact on higher education? Put another way, how are colleges and universities going to change over the next 12 months? And I'd like to do this collectively. I'd like to do this with as much input and as many ideas from all of you as possible. That's how the forum works. But I've been asked by a few people to kick it off with some ideas. Uh, myself. Before I do that, before I do that, I want to try a little, a little exercise. I'd like you all to go to the chat box, and I want you to try this kind of popcorn exercise. I'd like you all just to type in, but don't hit return yet, just to type in the one thing that is uppermost in your mind that may have an impact on higher education. And that thing could be anywhere. That could be a specific technology. It could be economics. It could be something you're working on. It could be a change you see in policy. It could be something happening in the world at large. But just type in a word or a few words describing that. And then I'm gonna ask everybody to hit enter at the same time. This is sometimes called popcorn or the chat waterfall method. So, all right, everyone who has an idea, type in a word or a few words, and now go, hit enter, and let's see what comes up. Wow, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look at all of this. A lot of AI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Karen, what is the extended mind if you could just say a bit more about that, mega universities, recession, staffing and hiring. Joe, if you want to say a bit more about that, that'd be great. Uh, XR, enrollment challenges, students deciding not to attend colleges, experiential learning. Uh, Paul Cook mentions the general feeling of malaise and dissatisfaction the general public feels towards higher ed at this historical moment. Yeah, yeah. Divisive concepts, small liberal arts colleges um, and uh, in-person and AI balance. Knowledge management. Thank you, Krista, for sharing that. Um, wow, micro credential. Oh, this is fantastic. There's a lot going on here. Martin, um, uh, can you say a bit more about the new leadership there? And uh, Karen points out a new book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, some themes are really consistent here. Uh, we're seeing a lot about uh, AI, especially I'm guessing in Waco ChatGPT. Uh, we're seeing a concern about public attitudes and general attitudes towards higher education, including enrollment. Um, we're seeing uh, concerns about uh, staffing and finance. Um, oh, uh, Kate, innovative graduate curricula. Oh, if, if you can share an example of that, that would be great. That would be great. At least I'm not thinking about the House of Representatives right now. I, I, that's that's too much to, to cram in, but we may, we just mentioned that. Wow. See, this is why I love the forum, and this is why I love having conversations, because we have so much information here, so many ideas. Uh, Matthew Pilar weighs in with labor shortage leading to overcrowded classes. Oh, SEI, thank you, uh, or SEL. Thanks, Lisa. And Doug, Doug, Ho Doug uh, Hohelin, thank you for mentioning climate change solutions. Uh, that's a big topic for me personally, Doug, and, and we have more coming up with that. Wow, uh, you all are brilliant. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, unless anybody has any objections, let me know in the chat, uh, I'm gonna export this and add this to my next blog post because this is a terrific, terrific uh, kind of core sample about what we're thinking about. Uh, Kate Montgomery mentions human-centered graduate liberal studies education fused with professional organizational programming. Uh, good. That's a very big move. Uh, Brigine Urbe, or Urbe mentions uh, increased pressure to focus on the value of college and post-graduation outcomes. Yes, yes. And Pam Mack. Hey, Pam. 
mentions information in the federal course program of study rules uh, and shares a nice link. Thank you. Excellent. And Ted, thanks for the point about staffing. Uh, fantastic. Great. Okay. Oh, there's a lot to dig in there. And I, I, I think um, unless anybody has any objections, please feel free to uh, download that, that chat link. I can't think really of a better uh, overview of where, where higher education, um, where we're headed and also what we're thinking about that. Uh, let me, uh, I, I want to hear more about that. And I wanna just add a few more thoughts to the mix based on what I've been researching. And I, I want to do this without any slides. I want to do this without any special effects. I just want to quickly note some uh, some ideas and topics. And uh, I'm inspired by the great Cliff Lynch and his work at the Coalition for Network Information, who does something similar. But I'm also grateful to uh, supporters on Patreon, who gave a lot of ideas, as well as supporters elsewhere on social media. So just really quick, and please, please, I, I'm going to be quick here. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts as as this goes. Uh, first, I want to touch on changes in the world, trends in the overall world um, that are starting to impact higher education. Uh, and so to begin with, uh, one of them is geopolitics. Uh, we have the continuing Russian war in Ukraine, which has all kinds of spillover effects. Uh, we have issues, for example, in uh, the global economy. As a result, we have challenges to energy politics, energy support. Uh, and we've already seen impacts on, you know, for example, European universities and cultural institutions, which are changing their hours and their times and what they're offering, even changing their calendars. Uh, I think a larger scale, we have deepening U.S.-China tensions. Uh, I've been tracking this for a decade now, uh, and this has already started to appear in terms of governments intervening in, in, in higher education, including a series of uh, high-profile prosecutions of Chinese scientists in the U.S. Uh, we should expect to see more of this, and that may shape, among other things, international education, as both Beijing and Washington try to get different nations involved in supporting their cause in this big geopolitical division. So watch for how that can go. Uh, also on the global level, we have continuing debates about how to do international higher education. Uh, that is, you know, do we increase it? Do we have demand for more of it? Do we, and, and international higher education includes both the movement of students across international boundaries, <clears throat> as well as uh, how we conduct international education and how we do international research. Um, there's also resistance where we have, or of competing modes where people have ideas of making higher education more local, more locally centered in uh, curricula, in culture, uh, politics. Uh, a third one, and this is a huge one, uh, is the continuing demographic transition uh, where we're seeing basically uh, a continued extension of lifespans with one exception, and we're seeing a decrease in the production of children. And this has already started to impact higher education in some areas, and this is a deep, powerful trend that I see nothing really chewing it up. The one exception I mentioned is that in the United States, uh, we've had uh, declines in uh, life expectancy uh, for various reasons, including COVID and including deaths of despair. And we've also seen some degree of life expectancy challenges due to COVID worldwide, although the data on that is, is pretty hard to get. Again, these are world issues. Another um, uh, thing to think about in terms of demographics is how we have racial and ethnic changes in some areas. For example, in Europe, increasing amounts of African and Middle Eastern students and immigrants, uh, the expanding Latino population in the U.S., as well as the declining black, uh, white population. A macroeconomic well, macroeconomics here have a lot of, obviously a lot to say, uh, but one of them has to do with the uh, continued challenges to global economic growth. Uh, we're seeing this in some of the big powerhouses, notably the US, China, and Europe. Uh, we're also seeing problems of inflation ricocheting up uh, unevenly different places, uh, and also rising interest in competing economic models, such as no growth or degrowth, the circular economy or the donut economy. And all these start to impact higher ed. Uh, we've talked about um, as well, uh, in the U.S., uh, we have a major Supreme Court case involving uh, the consideration of race and admissions. Uh, and depending on how that turns out, depending on their ruling, that may have powerful impacts on enrollment as well as student life and student support. We also in the U.S. have continued 
uh, struggles over uh, the financing of higher ed. Uh, we'll say more about that in a bit, but specifically including student loans. Uh, what happens with repayment, which has been deferred again and again? What happens with forgiveness, uh, which is now held up in court? Uh, so those are a couple of uh, economic issues as well. I'm still talking about the outside world, and, and you can't talk about higher ed without, without doing that. I want to mention two more uh, issues. In some countries, including the U.S., we have uh, challenges of domestic unrest. Um, and this can play out in terms of official national politics. This can play out in terms of violence. Uh, this can play out as well as uh, in terms of increasing skepticism about expertise and about higher education in general. And perhaps uh, on an equal level, maybe even more significant depending on how this goes, is uh, developments in technology. A lot of you mentioned uh, AI. Uh, generative AI is finally taking off, and we're seeing a lot of interesting uh, responses to ChatGPT and generative uh, visual art in recent months. Uh, just yesterday, we saw that New York City's public schools, K-12, through just blocked chat GPT from all of them. We'll see how that works. We're also seeing the internet continue to fragment. Um, that is more and more platforms, more silos, more local things, sometimes driven by, for, by business, sometimes by governments. Uh, we're also seeing Bitcoin continue to be challenged. The Bitcoin values drop and we have more scandals and more uh, implosions of services. And on top of that, there's the uh, two other fields, which is social media, which continues to be widely used if widely disliked, but may be more regulated coming up. And we also see extended reality, virtual reality and augmented reality continue to grow. Um, that's a whole slew of forces and trends. Um, I want to talk about changes within higher education, but I, I'd like to hear from, from you all right now. What are some of your thoughts, some of your responses to those huge changes in the world around higher education? Um, please uh, use the chat box, of course, um, but you can also just click the uh, Q&A box. Um, in fact, uh, we have one uh, observation right now uh, from the excellent, hardworking Glenn McGee, and I want to put this up. Um, and this has to do with international education as well as how we structure higher ed, um, which is the, um, oh, here we go. Uh, global credential inflation is driving international students like Chinese coming to the U.S. So credential inflation, and Glenn will be happy to talk about this, uh, is just the increasing demand for and increasing production of higher education credentials. Uh, and this, Glenn, if I understand this correctly, uh, you see this driving uh, American colleges and universities reaching out for more international students, especially China, or perhaps you see credential inflation occurring in higher in China as well. Uh, Lisa Durf asks, uh, how do schools and universities expect us to teach intelligent use of those tools if they're blocked? That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, we, uh, we're, we've been talking about this for a few weeks in the forum, and I've got a few blog posts uh, coming up on this. But right now, blocking ChatGPT, access to that and other tools is one option uh, that some will explore, um, just banning that straight up. Um, and that, of course, has all kinds of limitations and flaws. Uh, we also talked about different ways of teaching uh, with ChatGPT. I'll, I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Doug Hoholin, Doug, and I hope I'm not mangling your last name, uh, mentions integrated AI. Um, the sky is infinite. I don't know what that is. I'd like to check that out. Um, I'd like to find more about uh, what that means. Thank you. Uh, and Pam mentions that Clemson University applications keep going up. The overall trends of the number of students have very different effects in different universities. Absolutely. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then uh, I believe that's uh, Lorene uh, Barba mentions policing student behavior never contributes to learning the big heavy sigh. Doesn't look like we have a lot of fans of blocking chat GPT here. Yes. Uh, Lisa mentions Mastodon. I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to mention that because I wanted to talk about social media a bit more, but we have the uh, uh, interesting dual thread that we experienced for the past year uh, where Facebook experienced declining numbers, and Twitter experienced chaos with the uh, Elon Musk takeover. And among other things, this has led to interest and creation of alternative social media platforms. Uh, the Mastodon Federated Universe of Instances has been one that's been growing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go. Um, okay. 
I think let me grab a bunch of it. And let me just let me add and let me bring this into uh, uh, some of our some of the higher education changes that are occurring within our institutions. Uh, so, and this, Pam, uh, I'll start off with you. We have the, uh, for the past 10 years, we've seen overall enrollment uh, decline in American higher education. That is the total number of students enrolled in American colleges and universities has gone down about 1% a year until the pandemic, then the decline raced up to three or 4%. Um, we're also, and as Pam mentions, this is uneven. Uh, Harvard is not suffering. Uh, from declining applications, for example. The common application makes it easier to apply. Um, but we've also seen some institutions really get clobbered by this. And again, the total uh, well, enrollment decline is very important since higher, America and many other countries are committed to increasing access to higher education. If that is still our cultural commitment, then we are actually, as a whole, doing the reverse. Uh, we are decreasing. Uh, human access to higher education, especially if you think about this in national terms, since we have so many international students. Also within enrollment, we're seeing changes within what classes people take. A long running trend uh, is uh, STEM classes, especially life sciences and computer science have been seeing continuing growth, um, more or less across the board. Um, although some cases that backfires, we're seeing the arts and humanities decline uh, and continue to decline pretty steadily. Uh, we're also seeing more enrollment in online classes and more online programs. Uh, we saw that growing for the past generation, but uh, COVID looks like it gave us a net boost to that trend. In addition, within higher ed, we're seeing more interest in new pedagogies, uh, and that might be new depending on your value of new. That might be uh, blended learning, hybrid learning, but also COVID showed us high flex at scale, uh, but also a new commitment to teaching and learning where people are really interested in um, improving how we teach and learn. I, I think partly this may be a, a response to enrollment challenges, but also just to a sense of care. We want to do a better job for our students. Uh, speaking of which, we're also seeing continued work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, usually abbreviated DEI in the U.S., uh, and this is occurring particularly along lines of uh, minoritized or marginalized populations. And this has led to changes, of course, in everything from the physical campus to tenure promotion, hiring and review, to curricula, to pedagogy. Uh, and that seems likely to continue. Uh, we're also seeing uh, a trickle of institutional closures and mergers, uh, very, very small numbers, but significant. Um, and we may see more of that going ahead, especially as the federal government isn't giving a lot of money uh, to higher ed in a new way. Um, we're also seeing staff cuts, program cuts, which I've called queen sacrifices, and we'll probably see more of that as enrollment patterns continue. Uh, we're seeing increasing labor activism uh, among a wide range of populations, including graduate students, student workers, adjunct faculty and some staff. It's still small as a proportion of the overall whole, but it's growing um, historically. And uh, on top of this, we're also seeing, as some people pointed out, continued production in some fields. That is uh, open education, open access and scholarly publication, the whole open world. We continue to produce more stuff that continues to grow by all data being able to find. And we're also seeing more and more growth of micro-credentials, um, you know, either bo both being offered uh, and being used. Um, let me just pause here right now, because that's a whole ton of stuff. I, I want to hear more from each of you about uh, where you think those changes within higher education uh, are going and what kind of impact they, they might have. Uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn McGee added um, in response to my question, uh, that stratification is happening based on, on degrees. Yes, uh, this is a good point. And Glenn, if you want to share that uh, dissertation, that would be great. And here we've got a point from Ed Finn. Uh, and Ed points out, to the demographic changes in enrollment question, I think we'll see more demand and pushback regarding online and in-person learning. Do you see this as a point of contention? Uh, absolutely. Uh, higher, uh, online education is one of the most contentious topics within higher education and to a degree outside of higher education. Uh, it's been growing. Uh, all the data we have shows that more and more students are taking more classes, taking more programs, degrees, uh, more campuses are offering them and other non-campus entities are offering them. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of skepticism, uh, sometimes inherited, 
uh, from you know a generation of developing online learning. Sometimes the skepticism comes from the COVID experience where people associate COVID with online learning and therefore with pain and trauma, decreasing educational outcomes and so on. Uh, I think part of it is associated as well with the increasing criticism and skepticism of Silicon Valley and technology as a whole, what the British uh, media sometimes call the tech lash. Um, and also, I, I think that it's just a classic transformational, institutional transformation um, question, you know, how you take institutions that are based primarily in face-to-face -face experience and move more and more of their operations online. It's not a new problem. We've been dealing with it since the 80s, maybe the 70s, depending on where you look. Um, but I think that will likely continue to be contentious. On the other side, of course, there are all the, all the pluses and all the reasons why people want online education, starting with uh, convenience and access for adult learners, which is really, really huge. Plus, we have increasing emphases on improving higher education online and making the quality better and better. Um, and on top of that, I think we may see more institutions where the online function ends up supporting the face-to-face. -face. Um, it's a, a great point. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Uh, again, if you're new to the Future Transform, by the way, what Ed did was he just went to the bottom of the screen along that white strip, hit the Q&A box. So please, please add some more of your, uh, more of your questions and answers. I would love to hear uh, and share them all. Uh, uh, Hope uh, Wendell mentions uh, they're surprised to hear an uptick of students applying or only colleges and universities in Europe since the price tag is more reasonable. I'm expecting to see more and more of that, honestly, and it, it hasn't been happening uh, in the numbers. But I, I, it seems in many ways like a very exciting alternative for a lot of Americans. You know, the chance to go to another country um, the, if you really want to get away from home, but also if you want to learn about another society, uh, experience it, and above all, to get a degree without a whole lot of debt. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea here. Um, so we should see more and more of that. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Joanne Martin mentions that uh, uh, she went to grad school in Europe. Where'd you go, Joanne? I'd love to hear that. And then Mary Nunn. Um, oh, oh, this is really, really important. Mary, I'm so glad you said this. Uh, let me just bring this up on the screen here. Uh, Mary mentions redefining academic freedom in regards to the intersection, institutional success, faculty performance, accountability, and shared governance. This is huge. So friends, I, I just want to, Mary, thank you so much for mentioning this. I want to keep this up here a little bit longer. Uh, we have talked about academic freedom on the forum several times. We have a, a, a series of really, really great sessions, which I recommend to you. Um, so there are two key parts here. One is academic freedom as a whole. Uh, and that's a question of how we think about that and how we redefine it. And that always changes. There's always been ways of rethinking that. And we've been seeing that uh, all over the U.S. in different ways, thinking about, for example, uh, Florida's government, which is trying to, and other states, trying to shape what, what faculty teach in terms of uh, so-called divisive concepts, especially around diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we've also seen this most recently with uh, one college where a faculty member was basically fired uh, for teaching images that some students and the administration found inappropriate. Um, there's a whole series of questions about how does faculty academic freedom as well as student academic freedom play out in terms of uh, employment status, in terms of academic field, where does the freedom live in terms of scholarship versus teaching versus uh, extramural conversation. But but all of that gets added to the question of institutional success, faculty performance and accountability and shared governance. So how does, a, you know, does an institution try to improve all of these things while at the same time preserving academic freedom? Uh, Mary, that's a terrific question, a quick topic. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, also, right now, um, I want to make sure that uh, people feel they can uh, um, if they want, they can uh, join me on stage. So what I'm going to do here is uh, um, set up a podium. Um, and if any one of you wants to just pop on stage and join me, just click this teal colored podium box and you should be there. Um, and by the way, I'm not doing this by myself. I'm joined as I have been for months by the brilliant Wesson Radomski. Uh, they're a, a former student uh, at Georgetown University, and Wesson is there to help all of you in case you have any technical problems or any technological challenges. We also have a question from uh, Krista Morrison, and let me just bring this up on stage too. I'm so glad to see it. 
um, criticizes the changes to, in how and where we work will also continue to have an impact. Yes. Is there an indication of how 2021 work changes and choices change the way we teach and learn? Krista, I'm so glad you mentioned this. Uh, this is a huge, huge issue uh, because uh, we had the, obviously a lot of fields, not all of them, uh, saw the big push to work from home or work remotely during the early stages of the pandemic. And there's been a struggle back and forth since then to try to rejigger this. You have companies like Apple, which have been pushing very hard for more and more workers to be working on site physically. And you have the opposite. You have enterprises where they would prefer to have students, I'm sorry, prefer to have workers working wherever they're most comfortable and where they see themselves as most productive. I've seen different stats about this. I've heard up to 30% of, uh, of uh, jobs now have work from home as something which is not crazy, but actually you know, mainstream and available. Um, this changes our society and economy in all kinds of ways. I mean, you think, for example, about uh, the greater pressure placed on people who have to work in person. You think about, say, retail workers or frontline medical staff. It changes how we become more digitized, more remote if we're working from home or working otherwise remotely. But also for teaching and learning, it may serve as a kind of boost for online learning because it gets more and more people more comfortable, more familiar with working remotely, with living, thinking, and learning online. Uh, so it may push that as well. So I, I think that's a terrific topic. That's a terrific topic. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and then um, Mary uh, mentions that she'd like to have more discussion on this issue. Mary, me too. In fact, uh, if you want to join us to say a bit more about this, um, click the teal colored uh, podium. I'd love to have you up on stage. Hey, and it looks like there's Mary. Hello. Hi, Mary. Hi, hold on two seconds. Let me uh, change my settings here. Sure. No problem. We can hear you just fine. All right, great. Hey, um, we can see you. Hi. Hi. Um, I wasn't expecting to come up on your podium. I feel so honored. Oh, it's a pleasure. Oh, always glad to have you. Where are you coming from this morning or um, this afternoon? Uh, uh, it is afternoon. I am in Phoenix, Arizona. Ah, ah. So, yes. Um, so I, I am actually very interested in this. I'm a training development consultant for a community college here in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And um, I was tenured faculty and I left it to become essentially uh, the position that I'm in right now. Um, and one of the uh, issues that I'm seeing within institutions is with academic freedom is that in our particular institution, uh, faculty perceive anybody looking at their course and helping them be better teachers um, as, as a means of violating academic freedom. Mm -hmm. And so we have this huge argument district-wide, there's 10 colleges in my district. And the, the argument is, is that quality matters is essentially a way of micromanaging faculty's content and not necessarily looking at the quality of education that they're delivering. And um, my background is in adult literacy and um, critical thinking, ironically, and, uh -huh. uh, and, and linguistics. And so <clears throat> for me, I really struggle. And also I came from K-12 many moons ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I really, I, I really struggle, and as a faculty member, I really also struggled with this. And now in my position, I'm, I'm also struggling with this, is that how, how as an institution are we supposed to be successful? And if we do have students that are paying for the service called their education and their degree, mm -hmm. there has to be some kind of accountability on the faculty side. And I know this is probably gonna get me in a, hot, a lot of hot water because it's a very taboo issue. And, um, but, you know, there has to be some kind of, you know, accountability. There has to be, and, you know, when you have, when you have groups that are writing in their, in their policy that they cannot be held mm. accountable for their behavior or for their teaching and for their success and all these different things, then what's happening with that institution? So, um, you know, and what's happening with that institutional success. And so, you know, one of one of our, com I don't want to say competitors, but, you know, U of A and NAU, uh, University of Arizona, Arizona State University and Northern Arizona University, they are um, making a lot of money. And I hate to bring it back to money, 
but there's also a sense of quality control that happens within course design. So when you're talking about the course design and not the content, there's that, there's that, I guess that conflict of what determines academic or, or the, the conflict around what determines academic freedom. So how as institutions, and I know that my, my district is not the only district that's having this discussion. Mm -hmm. It seems it is, it is a national discussion, but how do we look at what our role is as educators and the service that we are providing, but also realize that yes, we are the subject matter experts, but we also have an obligation to deliver our subject content in a way that is um, consumable by the people that are paying for it. So how how do we as as educators m move more towards that area of why we're teaching and what we're here for? Or, you know, instead of just going on this path of I am the subject matter expert, therefore I know everything. And so and, and fulfilling that old stereotype of faculty and professors being disconnected from you know, mm -hmm. their, their population of who they teach. So this is a, a wonderful topic. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And please don't don't feel nervous. We'll, this is a welcoming environment. And I, I, um, uh, we have disagreement of all kinds, but, uh, I'm, but I'm sure we do. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just putting in the chat a link to uh, a book about um, that I think is a good contribution to this. It's from a, a great scholar and academic leader, the late uh, Bill Bowen, um, called Locus of Authority. And it was him uh, exploring what happens to faculty governance in terms of trying to improve an institution. It's an yeah. exquisitely delicate book, very, very careful about these issues. Uh, so I wanted to recommend that. I, um, Thank you. Uh, we have a couple, it, just the chat had a few different responses. Uh, one person mentioned that uh, uh, quality control is a product control, it's a business uh, uh, concept. Um, someone else pointed out or argued that um, uh, academic freedom um, uh, shouldn't include the freedom to teach badly. Um, and then uh, uh, Karen Costa uh, has always thoughtfully weighs in by saying, this is a, a pickle. Uh, I try to consider the middle path. There are faculty development support models that strike a balance between academic freedom and accountability. Um, and yeah, Karen, I'd love to see uh, more, more of, of that kind of, uh, uh, more examples of that where that's done well. Agreed. Um, Lisa Durf says, we're hired to do a job. Where does it say we don't have to deliver a quality of a certain level? That's my question. That if you have faculty that are writing policy that say that they can't be held accountable for the quality of what they're delivering, then why are they in an industry? And I hate to use the word industry, but education is an industry. Why are we in an industry where we are providing a service? We go, we don't go to a restaurant and expect, you know, crappy service. So why, you know, the, we're playing with people's lives, and mm. why wouldn't we want to give the best version of ourselves? So, one, let me ask one quick question, Mary, and then I, I, I want to add somebody else to our our, our, our video screen. Um, to follow up on this, do you see anything particular happening in this area in the next 12 months? Um, is is anything coming up which might inflect that, that we should be looking out for? Man, that that is a tough question. I don't think there's some anything on the immediate horizon, but I think that COVID definitely in the pandemic and how technology and e-learning have essentially revolutionized mm -hmm. learning in general. I, I think that either we get on the boat and we really start reimagining what education and higher education looks like instead of holding on to these old these old yeah. old visions of what education. So I think that it it is there something tangible? I can't say that because I, I I wish I was a fortune teller, but I'm not. Um, but I really feel like that this is something that it 
the way technology is is morphing so quickly at this point in time, we as institutions need to really recognize that. Otherwise, higher education will become obsolete and people will be going more towards certificate programs and badging and things like that. And, you know, there is a lot to be said about the importance of humanities and social sciences and things of that nature because they they can be done really well online but we need to really start looking at how can they be done look done online so well said thank thank you that's a really really thoughtful answer to my annoying question um that was a lot that was a lot i mean i hope i was like somewhere on target you're so. terrific uh, and you're you. an expert in, and look grappling with the future is what we do um, this there is are why a couple I love of, you. <laughs> well, you're, you're very kind. Uh, this is a great community. We had a couple of quick responses that came up in chat. Uh, Matthew Plourd points out that we have uh, people who, uh, a lot of the teaching is done by people who are adjuncts or in the Canadian setting, uh, sessionals. And that's an important part where it comes to faculty governance since uh, those uh, populations have very little of it. Um, and we're also being joined by Doug Huhulin. Doug, am I am I butchering your name terribly? No, that's good. It's, uh, no, it rhymes with no foolin. No foolin, ho hoolin. Ho hoolin. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Swiss. <laughs> my, well, my well, welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you. How are you doing? I am doing well. Yeah. So I've been uh, working with a couple universities. We actually, uh, KU School of Nursing has won uh, um, a prize for education um, in using XR technology and devices um, and also working with the University of Central Missouri. But um, I'm also part of uh, this organization and they have different uh, committees. And one of them is on university education, both at um, undergraduate and then graduate level or um, K-12 mm -hmm. and then a university level. Um, so, you know, I saw the, the, some of the things around XR. I saw artificial intelligence, um, mm -hmm. exploring those mm -hmm. two together. Um, actually, I think there, there's gonna be a combination of those two um, my one comment that's why I decided to join, um, you know, the panel is, you know, this, I worked at Motorola and Nokia for 33 years. And oh, wow. so when I first started working with Motorola, a cell phone weighed three pounds, cost $3,000, had 30 minute battery life and cost yeah. $3 a minute to a phone call. And now everyone has a cell phone in their pocket and they, they interact with the, the uh, internet with their cell phone, like 56% of the time. You know, so it just tr totally transforms how we live, work, learn, and play. Um, you know, from an educational perspective, you know, just like the computer transformed education in the '90s and to the 2000s, 2010s, and you had the tablets. The question is, what will this new immersive devices mean? One of them is on climate change uh, solutions that people don't have to travel as much. You know, you have distance learning. That's one thing we're exploring. Um, and my final comment in, is that right now this technology is clunky. I mean, you weigh a pound on putting your head, you know, after about 30 minutes, people are really tired of it. Actually, if you're beginning, mm -hmm. don't spend more than 10 minutes on this technology. But uh, over the next five years, you'll, be, you'll literally be putting on a pair of glasses and you'll have this immersive experience. So, um, you know, I think the next five years are going to be an exciting ride to see where this technology goes and what it does to the brick and mortar aspect of the universities as well as mm -hmm. um, the distance learning and just learning in general. Oh, I agree, I agree. And, and you mentioned this is a five-year uh, horizon for uh, XR. Do you, are you looking forward to any particular developments over the next year? Uh, yeah, so, you know, they're like Apple's supposed to come out with a device. So right now devices are heavy. I mean, there are uh, devices that are more monitors like here, this mm -hmm. is the new eyes glasses. Um, mm -hmm. It has, still has a wire on it, but it's eight, mm -hmm. weighs eight grams. Um, so this is something you can wear, you know, basically just like a pair of glasses all day. Um, but with a, a one pound device, it is heavy. You can get motion sickness because the, the quality right. of the, the eyesight is not as good. So, you know, Qualcomm's coming out with a new chip at the end of this year um, that will help reduce the size and weight, uh, adds artificial, more artificial intelligence to it. Um, and I see that, you know, the combination of, of devices and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. together to help guide the student. Um, in fact, I put into the chat, uh, I worked, um, we got a, a $50,000 prize from Cable Labs on, you know, what is the future of education? And, you know, looking at how would you have AI assistance for the student to give them guidance? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, students shouldn't just regurgitate whatever they, you know, you know, okay, teacher wants me to give them X and I just find, you know, here I repeat the, the solution and give them the answer, right? And I don't vet anything, you know, that that's bad. But using the tools to understand how to solve the problem is very valuable. And so that I think is where education needs to be, you know, focus is using any tool that's available to maximize a goal. And uh, the goal is to learn and to become lifelong learners, right? And so, you know, okay, I learned how to do X today, but I know the process of learning so that if I need to learn Y tomorrow, I know how to do that. And uh, so be, uh, learning how to learn is so critical, I think, in education. Agreed, agreed. Uh, Doug, can I keep you up here on stage for a minute more? Oh, sure. Yeah, and for everybody, if you're looking at XR, again, XR is that synthesis of augmented reality and virtual reality. Let me just recommend the uh, Digital Bodies crew, Maya Gorgieva and uh, Emery Craig, previous guests in the program who run a wonderful website on this. They are still, for me, the go-to people for XR in, in higher education. Uh, we also have the very, very patient uh, Krista Morrison, uh, who had a hand up, and I want to make sure uh, she can join us. Hi. Um, hi, Krista. Hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Um, yes. You? you can hear me well? Perfectly. Yeah, just to sort of get give my background. Um, so my background is basically media, and I'm very mm -hmm. much focused on um, what did we learn, uh, you know, in media organizations in terms of how do we um, create content, how do we distribute content, how can we do things better now with uh, generative AI and et cetera. But then also I've been teaching and I've been supporting educators in the teaching and learning center. And now I'm in a central IT department at the university, helping people adopt cloud technologies. And if I, I really spend a lot of time over my break, trying to process where we are with this massive advancement of um, creating a full, you know, course syllabus in two seconds by asking ChatGPT to do it, and it's doing a great job, and I just have to review it. So for me, I think we are basically at the end of era of human writers. We, we, we don't wow. need that anymore. We now need people who can edit, review, and build upon. Um, but having said this, what we what 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 I think we have as an opportunity is to focus on knowledge management strategies. And I've shared a few lines with you, and it's basically um, uh, drawn from a Gardner report about a knowledge management framework that they um, that they suggest we use. But really, if you look at that, um, the previous uh, was it Mary? also mm -hmm. talked about or the previous speaker talked about how do we evaluate it's it's about governance if we if we have people and they work with knowledge and that's what we all do we knowledge institutions in fact we live in the knowledge era but if you look at you know what we are made up of we have people we have knowledge. We are now creating knowledge so fast. We we can do so much more with knowledge now in collaboration with AI. And we have to learn how, how do we do things now that we don't have to rely on our own abilities and limitations anymore. I think that the, the answer is wow. how do we manage the solutions we find the new ideas we find how do we connect people and the ideas and the existing um you know science and knowledge and the new data insights how do we manage and connect all of this for example at my university like we support people you know in terms of technology we support mm -hmm. people in the teaching and learning center then we have you know the library we have so many different places but if we can have one place where the people, the knowledge that they are working with can be all connected and, you know, where, where, where we have the places, where we have this plan and this map in our minds of, yes, they are getting together in a community of practice. They are getting together, um, you know, in, in small groups doing this. 
They are using Teams for this. They are using that for that. Oh, they are sharing everything on their SharePoint website. That's where we can all see the, the, the public knowledge. That's where we can discover who has built up some subject matter expertise in X, Y, Z. So it's really about, you know, building that knowledge framework where people mm. can find each other and the knowledge and the content that we have. That's Krista, I'm that's a fantastic vision. Uh, are, are you seeing anybody that we should be paying attention to who is doing that combination of a structured knowledge map ontology plus social connection? I'm, I'm ex well, I, I have such limited experience in terms of what I call these experience platforms, because up until now in education, we have learning management systems and then we have all our other systems. And if I look at, you know, media companies and stuff, what happened over the last 10 years in media companies is the number of dashboards we have that give us data insight in real time. So many people are now reading this article on Twitter or on your website or whatever. We can respond to things. We can see what is trending where. Oh, that person is trending because that person gets a lot of, you know, views on YouTube or whatever. We, we have those systems in place that can connect yes. people to see where are the hotspots, where is the new things happening. We don't mm -hmm. have that in our organizations yet. But with my limited experience, I can see that Microsoft 365 is, is aiming to go in that direction where we have this, uh, this experience platforms with, I think, with the idea of the six Viva apps where, where they want to connect content and people and make it more discoverable. And given that Microsoft is a big investor of the open AI, which of course they're going to have to, you know, um, implement some of the chat GPT um, and yes. all the other generative AI more, yes. more rapidly now within mm -hmm. their own. I mean, Word, MS Word, um, they already announced that now in January, they're going to roll out the feature where we can summarize any Word document. And that was before yeah. chat GPT got so much interest and is learning so fast because of the millions of people, you know, uh, providing their data for free there now. Yeah, cool. so I don't know. There, there, there is definitely going to be new platforms for us. And it's and I think it's going to be about knowledge management. Thank you. That's, that's a great vision. Thank you, Krista. Welcome. Yeah, the, the one comment I would add is uh, chat GPT-4 is coming out in the next couple months. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that AI document I, I forwarded, I put, I put in the link, um, gives mm -hmm. a summary of where we are with with uh, you know generative AI today and and the different uh, you know um, uh, you know AI uh, platforms available today and where technology is going. But I heard one place that it could be a factor of ninety, which though I doubt that. But even if it's a factor of ten improvement of Jet Chat GPT three question is what will G chat GPT four and five and six um, Google's yeah. doing a lot of work. So there's a lot of investment in this space. Um, so, you know, yeah, today it may be clunky, just like devices are clunky. But uh, if you think of where the first cell phone was in eighties to where it is today, um, you know, That's the next fair. 10 years is going to just be incredible for um, AI. Um, in fact, there's some uh, technology uh, is called GANs, a generative um, mm -hmm. networks. So, you know, right now, if you put in an essay, it will tell you not only is it plagiarized, but how much of it is written by an AI. Well, if you get a better AI, it will then write, rewrite it so that it will spoof the other AI. So it's kind of like this adversary network going back and forth. It's kind of the yeah. arms race, right? You know, it's like, OK, the students are trying to use this tool to, to uh, you know, to spoof the teachers. But then, you know, if they get a better tool, then it will fake out the teachers for a while. Um, so anyway, it's, it's going to be an uh, interesting ride. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer is what we want at the end of the day is to have students that can use tools to solve problems and, and to know how to solve problems that they, you know, they just don't follow robotically, that they don't become more like the robots, right? We want them to be the, uh, the overlords of the robots, um, or, you know, directing the tools, but not just following the tools information. 
and regurgitating that information. And personally, I think that's something when you're teaching students how to use these tools, it's like if all you're doing is regurgitating this, you're just wasting my time as a teacher. You're wasting my time or you're wasting your time. Uh, you know, it, you know, monkey can regurgitate the two. I don't Speaking know if this was shame. I, I, Sorry. Uh, we're, we're, all, we're almost out of time. Uh, please go, go, go ahead, Krista. You can be quick. I just, I, because I see it's a lot of interest in AI. Those of you who are not aware of the um, AI conference um, in learning and education that happened beginning of December, I highly recommend you watch those sessions. They are available on YouTube, on the Grail um, YouTube um, uh, channel. It's G-R-A-I-L-E, A-I. -E it's on my LinkedIn. I've shared it there as well. Um, but what a great. You know, I'll put it in chat as well. Okay. Thank you. That's a great link. Let, let, me, let me raise one more topic uh, to close out with. And I, I'm going to raise this topic with a, a question for all of you. And I, I'd like you to consider it and think about it. Uh, and then if you could say a bit either in a chat or in a um, uh, in a Q&A. Um, the climate crisis is continuing to ratchet up and it's going to be having lots of impacts on higher education and the higher education can respond in different ways. Um, my, my analysis is that over the next 12 months we will see this continue to increase uh, in different ways. What I'd like to put before you, and we'll have sessions on this, but let me put before you an idea. Think about your own institution, your college, your university, or your publishing house, or your library, or your museum. And I'd like you to imagine it's July 2023, and a huge climate disaster strikes not your institution, but elsewhere. Um, and I'd like to pick Miami, uh, Florida, for this. The disaster includes a whole series of storm surges, waves, and floods, which effectively flood the area for weeks, uh, but also we get uh, an incredibly high spike in wet bulb temperature. That's a combination of temperature and humidity. What I'd like you to think about, and I just want to hear your thoughts, is at your institution, assuming you're at Florida, and if you're in Florida, please go ahead, I'd like to hear it, but if, if you're in Canada, if you're in France, if you're in California, wherever, how do you think your institution would respond to that Miami climate disaster? Do you think you would offer to physically host academic climate refugees or non-academic climate refugees? Would you offer some uh, form of academic assistance, such as offering online classes? Or would you do something else? How might that play out? Take a minute and think about this. You know, Doug suggests another pandemic. This is this is something that uh, that I read about. How might your institution respond? Uh, in the chat, Lisa Durf says that she hopes that they would open the doors to students online. That's too far for face-to-face -face assistance. Um, uh, Carl Ejo says another pandemic or more of the same pandemic. So that we might respond in that way. Um, if I understand you correctly, Carl, uh, Heather Churchill says, I would hope there would be a response similar to after Katrina. I was a student that was welcomed by many different universities, opened their doors to students. Not sure about faculty and staff, though. Uh, Mathieu Plourd says, in Quebec, our institution would release a statement in support of the people impacted, and that would be the end of it. So we have a few different models. What do you think about that? It might not be climate change that we that occurs as the great problem um, in in 2023. It might be something else, such as as some of you point out, another pandemic or an iteration of COVID. It might be some other challenge or some other disaster. But I want you to think about this and to keep that in mind, and also keep in mind the possibility that we have a lot of ways that we can respond to help academics and the population at large. Now, it is the end of the hour. And we have covered in a great collective way a whole bunch of ideas, a whole bunch of trends and topics about where higher education is headed over the next 12 months. 
I'm just exhilarated by all the ideas, all the all the content that you've all shared, all the thinking that we've done together. If you want to keep talking about this after I close this session out, please head to uh, some social media locations. My blog, for example, brianalexander.org. Uh, me on Mastodon, you can see my handle on Twitter and LinkedIn using the hashtag FTTE, and of course my handle there as well as the Shindig handle. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on a bunch of these topics, including AI, including governance, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you want to keep looking at other issues, we have a whole series of them coming up for the next two months. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can see a whole bunch of them. And if you are working on something this spring that you'd like to share with us and, and you want me to share with everybody else, please email me. I'd be delighted to do that. Once again, Thank you for thinking about the rest of the year with us together. It's a delightful experience, a thoughtful one with a lot of great ideas. Uh, I hope all of you have a fantastic 2023, and I'm just honored to be able to do it in company with all of you. In the meantime, take care, be safe and well, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.